Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Keeping with our Reformation Day, obviously it's Halloween, All Hallows' Eve officially, but the Protestants love to call it Reformation Day. Keeping with this theme, we're going to read an article here that appeared many years ago in the Latin Mass magazine. i got to thank our friend, Mr. Catholic Life, a Catholic Life on Twitter. You, know, you find his Twitter handle by that. Um, thank you for what you've done because um, he's put this on an app called Scribed which you can see here, it is sort of a, a PDF version of this. And I should say his real name is Matthew Pleasy. A Catholic Life is his, is his social media handle. And um, thank you to him for putting that there. And I'm just going to read the article uh, because it's amazing what's in this thing. So I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger here. And we're going to go through this. So this is called a, 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 colloquy, a colloquy with Satan or the spirit of Martin Luther. In the late 17th century, Abraham Woodhead lost his fellowship at University College Oxford because of his conversion. He went into hiding in Hoxton to write a series of books defending the Catholic Church. He never signed any of his works and so remained as his first biographer, biographer uh, Simon Barrington wrote in 1736, a great but almost unknown man. Yet William Carr, in his history of University College, rightly called him the most learned exponent of Catholic doctrine at the time. And Francis Nicholson, who had known Woodhead, said that even in his absence, he remained the glory of University College and our example for his virtues and writings. In a letter cited by Barrington, the Oxford antiquarian Thomas Hearn also praised him heartily. I always looked upon Mr. Abraham Woodhead to be one of the greatest men that ever this nation produced. When James II, a Catholic convert, became king, he issued a special license early in 1686 for the publication in Oxford of 36 of Woodhead's works without penalty from the anti-Catholic laws. A copy of this license is found in John Gutch's uh, Collect uh, Collectania Curiosa. As a result, the spirit of Martin Luther in the original of the Reformation appeared in, 19, in 1687. In Late Converts Exposed Part 2, Thomas Brown, who made a career out of attacking John Dryden for his conversion, wrote that the spirit of Martin Luther was what had turned the great English poet against the Reformation. Dryden eventually read it several and more, it and several more of Woodhead's works because, as I showed in a 2003 essay on this topic, the poet borrows quite a lot from Woodhead in The Hind and the Panther, a 2,500-line masterpiece in rhyme and arguably the greatest poem ever written in defense of the Catholic Church. Well, that's a good one. We should read that. Woodhead, who was temperate and humble, always took the high road in controversy. Um, he bent over backwards to be fair to his opponent. In the spirit of Martin Luther, he cites only Luther himself and his friends, not Luther's adversaries. Yet even from these limited resources, limited sources, excuse me, he shows how the first quote-unquote reformer was miserably deceived by the devil. In the following pages, I will summarize the central argument of this brilliant work. Although Martin Luther claimed that Satan was his own sworn enemy and that his new doctrines came from above, he admitted to, have, to having had frequent contacts with the fiend. One time he met him in his garden in the shape of a black boar. Another time, as he recounted in his colloquies, colloquies, excuse me, um, he was lying in the castle of Wartburg when the devils disturbed him by cracking nuts in a box near his bed and rolling empty barrels down the steps. He lamented, in my age, I am vexed and tormented with nothing but only with the tribulations and temptations of the devil who, wa who walks with me in my bedchamber. He strongly scowls upon me. He even mourned that the devil was closer to him than his wife. In the epistle to his father, which opens his book, De Votis Monasticis, he wondered whether I am the only mortal that he, Satan, thus assaults. Whenever he heard of sudden deaths, Luther would fall into terrors. His usual way of calming himself was to read scripture, especially the epistle to, Saint, to the Galatians in which he chiefly found support for his justification by our faith alone without works. Or else, he would ask those around him to sing psalms, especially the De Profundis, or distract himself with wine and conversation. The devil was often on his mind. Doctrines contrary to his own, even those proposed by fellow Protestants, he would declare to be all doctrines of the devil. And the... <laughs> if you're wrong, if you're not with Martin Luther, you're of the devil. Um... And uh, authors of them know better than persons possessed. I guess the word for that is sanat, sanit, oh, satanitati. Okay, yeah. In fact, 
His polemical writings are as full of his terrible name, Devil, as St. Paul's epistles are noted for the frequency of the saving name, Jesus. The core of the spirit of Martin Luther is Woodhead's analysis of Luther's colloquy with Satan in 1522. It is unforgettable. So this is a conversation between the two. Um, Luther had engaged in many previous negotiations and familiar disputes and conferences with the enemy of mankind, but this one was crucial. In De Misa Privata et Sacerdotum Unctione, 1533, he wrote of his long experience with Satan's arts and practices and many a sad and bitter night spent in talks with him, but the colloquy on the Mass that took place in 1522 had such an effect on him that he never offered another Mass. So basically, set the stage, Martin Luther spends so much time with Satan uh, that he spends nights talking to him. Contrast that with someone like Padre Pio, who was tormented by Satan all night. He wasn't having conversations and drinking tea with him. Luther sits around and hangs out with the devil, you know, and the devil convince him not to convince him not to say the mass. Well, if the mass is hated by Satan, we should probably uh, go to mass. Anyway, on that occasion, Satan, in a grave and strong voice, persuaded him that he had committed idolatry for 15 years by adoring and causing others to adore naked bread and wine. So if you are a Protestant and thinks and who thinks that that the mass is idolatry, well, you agree with Satan. So congratulations. Woodhead thinks Luther was deceived in the same way as the Pharisees were in the Gospel of John. Swayed by the devil's weak arguments against the Mass, Luther came to believe that he did God good service by attacking the church as the whore of Babylon and the spouse of Antichrist. Similarly, the Pharisees believed they served God by persecuting our Lord. Our Lord, however, declared that they were deceived. They were not at all the devil's enemies, as they imagined, but the devil's children who did the works of this their father and spoke his words. Indeed, one of the most dangerous lies that Satan insinuated into the Pharisees was that our Lord acted by all the power of the devil. He made the Pharisees hate Jesus chiefly on that account, that he was dealing with the devil. In reality, they were the ones who listened to Satan's lies and frightened the people from him on his account. For none are commonly more strongly possessed with him, Satan, than those that most rail at and abuse, if I may say so, and defy him. <laughs> okay. So you're more possessed by Satan if you rail at and abuse Satan. So if you hate Satan and say, be gone, Satan, you're possessed. Okay. Hence, Luther's frequent vilifying and uh, triumphing over the devil as a vanquished foe was no proof that he was not deceived by him. Two things Satan wants to accomplish in us. First, to reduce us by any means into an evil condition. And second, to breed in us a security in such condition. He encouraged Luther in his false security by making him think he was resisting temptations to despair when he was actually being tempted to presumption. Now, presumption is thinking our life is righteous and holy when it is not, and thinking that Christ's merits are applied to us by faith without, without, such, without such holiness when they are not. Woodhead is referring here to the presumption underlying Luther's doctrine of justification by faith alone without works. Conscience, often placed before Luther's eyes, the many ill consequences of his new doctrine, the great licentiousness of life that followed it, the disobedience of subjects, both to their ecclesiastical and civil superiors, shaking off all laws and discipline, the many new sects that sprang up every day, and those, in his own judgment, very impious. Okay. Seeing the fruit of his teaching, he became sorrowful, but the devil tricked him into thinking that it was not really his conscience that made him grieve, but the devil, who was trying to plunge him into despair. Therefore, Luther resisted this supposed temptation and went forward along the same road as before and imagined defiance of the devil. This was the remedy, which he also prescribed to his fellow Protestants, to blame the grief and the compunction raised by their conscience on the tempter of mankind, presumed for many a great enemy of his reformation. So I'm actually starting to, after this research I've done on Martin Luther, I'm starting to pity the man. Um, this was a man who was probably possessed by Satan and likely had something like syphilis. I mean, this was a very, very sad man. Woodhead shows how illogical Luther was in his negotiation with the devil, the father of lies. When he was still inside the Catholic Church, Luther said it was the devil who, by his arguments against the Mass, disputed him into a reformation. So the devil made him reform. Okay. Then, when he was outside the church, it must be the devil again that, with terrifying his conscience and telling him that his new doctrines had undone the world, endeavors to drive him back and make him undo his former work. 
So the devil tries to get Luther outside of the church. And then once he's outside of the church, the devil tries to show him what he did wrong. Martin Luther was the devil's plaything. Logically, if Luther concluded that his reformation was right because the devil opposed it, then why didn't he conclude earlier that because the devil opposed his saying mass and such other things, therefore he rightly performed then? Rightly performed them. Yeah. Luther was too confident that he could see through Satan's temptations. There is no safe place where he or any other person can stand out but this one, to be sure, not to be gotten out of the circle, which encloses all Catholics, of their obedience to their superiors and to subject their own private Holy Spirit, their own private Holy Spirit, yeah, if uh, I or they may call it so, to to the public Holy Spirit that dwells in God's church and to entertain no private senses and expositions of God's word contrary to the general one of the church from whomsoever these singular senses come, much less when they know they come from Satan. Well, in fact, in the most important colloquy Luther had with, had with Satan against the Mass, the devil showed great zeal to promote the private interpretation of the Bible. Instead of being suspicious of Satan's zeal for God's word, Luther believed him to be speaking the truth, only to tempt him to despair. My goodness gracious. Satan against the Mass. From Luther's own confession, Woodhead observes, it appears that the whole platform of the Reformation came originally from the devil. Wow, that's pretty shocking. Luther admitted in 1533 that he engaged he had engaged in a long disputation with Satan about the mass 11 years earlier and had yielded to Satan's arguments. These arguments became the basis of a book he produced the following year in 1523 called De Abominatione Misa Privata Quam Canotem Vocant. Um, on, uh, of the abomination of private mass commonly called the canon. So don't say private mass. It took... Another decade, however, before Luther would confess publicly in De Misa Privata, uh, a sacerdotem unctione, of private mass and priest's unction, that he had received these arguments from the devil. So Luther argued against the mass because the devil told him to. This caused a scandal among his followers, you think, and led some back to the Catholic Church. Woodhead reflects that it was surely by the merciful providence of God that Luther showed by the world by his own confession in 1533 who was the original founder and a better of the Reformation. In the following paragraphs, I will summarize and quote parts of Satan's major arguments against the Mass. Woodhead's replies are in brackets here, just as they are in the spirit of Martin Luther. So if you want to know what the, the, the devil said about the Mass, here you go. Satan begins by accusing Luther of having committed idolatry for 15 years, ever since he was ordained in 1507. This doesn't make any sense. Okay, I'm just going to pause here. I'm not saying this article this article makes perfect sense. I'm just saying, first of all, never listen to the devil. Second of all, if the devil's telling you not to that something is a sin, why would you like the devil's saying the mass is idolatry? That means the devil's trying to get you to stop saying mass, which means you should keep saying it. Just from the beginning, this thing stinks. And Protestants use the same arguments as Satan, apparently. So Figure that out. Um, What if in those masses you have practiced downright idolatry in adoring there and exhibiting to others to be adored, not the body and blood of Christ, but the naked bread and wine? Luther weakly protests that he was duly ordained by a bishop, obeyed his superiors in offering those masses, and pronounced the words of consecration with the greatest devotion I was able. Satan replies that um, uh, uh, Jeroboam, Jeroboam's um, false priests also acted under order with and with zeal, though contrary to the true priests at Jerusalem. What if your ordination and consecration all should be false? Woodhead notices that Satan notes that Satan institutes here, insinuates here, but does not prove. Satan then argues that Luther's ordination was indeed false because you had no, you had then no knowledge of Christ nor true faith. Wow. Woodhead remarks that Satan is referring here to Luther's new Solifidian doctrine or justification by faith alone without works, which the devil confirms to Luther as true. So if you believe in justification by faith, you agree with Satan. So there you go. Um, should not Luther have suspected his doctrine was false from Satan's recommending it? Ah, uh, you think? Should he not have replied that as a Catholic, he had true knowledge of Christ and a true faith? Yeah. Or, or, uh, or else Christ's church would have had done and then, 
or would have done. And then, how had not the gates of hell prevailed against it? Yeah. Satan continues to colloquy by charging Luther with having had his ordination no more, at his ordination, no more faith than we damn spirits do, who believe the history concerning Christ, yet do not accept him as a mediator or savior, but dread him as a severe judge. He also accuses the bishops who ordained Luther and others of having the same belief the devils have concerning Christ. Woodhead comments that Luther might have replied here that Satan lied, if not concerning his own, yet concerning the church's faith. Next, Satan argues that, not, that, no, uh, that for fear of Christ as a cruel judge, you address yourselves to St. Mary and other saints, making them mediators between you and Christ. So was Christ robbed of his glory. This neither, this neither you nor any other papist can deny. So the doctrine against Mary and the saints is from Satan. The doctrine against the mass is from Satan. The doctrine against the priesthood is from Satan. Okay, uh, so that's, you should know that if you think those things are bad. Woodhead says that Luther could have replied here that Satan misinterpreted the doctrine and practice of the church, for she desires the intercessions of the Virgin Mary and the saints in heaven in no other way than those of living saints. These intercessions do not infer Christ to be a cruel judge, nor the saints to be our mediators. How zealous Satan is to instruct Luther about the invocation of saints being prejudicial to our Lord's mediatorship, and how Luther and his followers have ever since endeavored to rectify the Christian world herein. Wow. Then Satan argues that the Mass is primarily a supper and requires more communicants than the priest, and that a sermon is also necessary. So the Mass is merely a supper. Uh, that the Mass was primarily a meal was actually in, the, inst in, in, in inst uh, the general instruction of the Roman Missal after the Second Vatican Council, by the way. It was taken out later, so that should tell you something. I wonder who was the spirit behind that. He begins by accusing Luther of having abused the Mass contrary to the institution of it, contrary to the mind and intent of Christ the Institutor. He explains that a true priest is a minister of the Church appointed to preach the Word and administer the sacraments, but you have constantly received this sacrament by yourself and not communicated it with others. Well, Woodhead says that Luther could have replied here that his receiving the sacrament alone was not his fault, but the fault of those attending, and that a priest is not obliged by any precept of our Lord's to bear, forbear offering to God the Father his commemorative sacrifice of the death of his Son, from which Christianity obtains so many benefits, and consequently the partaking it itself, it himself, when others do not also communicate with him. Yeah, it's a sacrifice offered to God. You don't have to offer this. The sacrifice is primarily for God. The spiritual benefits are for the remission of our sins and so on and so forth and sanctification of our souls. Um, and when I say remission of our sins, uh, it is the Catholic teaching that when you receive Holy Communion in a state of grace, your venial sins, um, the, 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 the effect of your venial sins is wiped away. So that's, that's what I mean. I'm not saying you should go when you haven't gone to confession. I'm just saying that. As for preaching, which Satan here makes a precept, Luther might have answered that an annunciation of Christ's death is made in the very form of the Mass, and this not only in the commemoration and representation of the sacrifice on the cross to God the Father, but also to the persons that either are or may be present in such uh, private Masses, but that a sermon is not required, for, not required ex precipto. So this is really important. The Mass is preaching because the math, Mass is the gospel acted out. So that's interesting. Just think for a moment here. If you're watching this as a Catholic and you're someone who defends the Novus Ordo experiment since the Council, obviously nothing in Catholic doctrine since then has gone so far as to say these exact things. But this mentality has been imbibed in many Catholics. You know, why would you go to a private Mass? Um, why, there should be a, there's a sermon at every daily Mass, or most of the time, for, low ma for daily Masses for the Novus Ordo. Uh, people should be there. Basically, this mentality is imbibed in the Novus Ordo experiment. And this is not of God. I mean, this is, this is an ancient work, or not ancient, this is an old work very close to the sources by an esteemed Catholic author um, who is a very important part of the church's history. And these arguments sound a lot like the kind of adjacent to the arguments you'll get from sort of apologists of the new springtime. So just think about that for a second. He continues, Satan now reaches the point of attacking the Mass as a sacrifice, and Woodhead notes that here we see from what author, zealous forsooth of the right understanding of Christ's institution and of God's truth and vindicating it from former errors, the Reformed have learned their opposition to the evangelical sacrifice of the altar. So he's saying here, opposition to the Catholic Mass is of Satan. So there you go. 
Satan faults the sacrament of ordination because it mentions sacrifice, when according to the traditional ceremony, he, the bishop, delivers the chalice into the hands of the then ordained. He says, take thou power of consecrating and sacrificing for the living and the dead. What a, what a sinister and perverse unction and ordination is this? What Christ has instituted and ordained to be eaten and drunk for the whole church and what ought to be given by the priest to other communicants, of this do you make a propitiatory sacrifice before God? Woodhead says that Luther could have retorted that the church calls the sacrifice of the altar propitiatorium, only in the application of the sole satisfactory sacrifice of our Lord offered on the cross. As also there were sacrifices under the law truly and properly called propitiatory, yet only so with relation to our Lord, our Lord's made at his death on the cross. So they're sacrificial for the forgiveness of sins and so on and so forth, but only in relation to that ultimate sacrifice already done by Christ. So they're not a new crucifixion, but they're re-represent, re-represent, representation of Calvary. Okay. Satan now argues for a private interpretation of Scripture against the church, church's authority. This is a place where Luther weakly lays down his arms, thinking the Catholic cause is completely defeated. He says that as he was contending with the devil, I thought to have vanquished this great enemy with those weapons I was wont to make use of while a papist. He tells Satan that even if he did not rightly believe and intend in celebrating Mass, yet the Church always rightly believes. Satan retorts with fake indignation. Show me, if you can, in Scripture where it is written that a wicked, faithless man may assist at Christ's altar and consecrate and make the sacraments in virtue of the Church's faith. Uh, with pretended zeal for God's word, the devil asks, Where has God commanded or enjoined any such thing? If now you have not the word of God for it, but men have taught this without God's word, then this whole doctrine is a lie. The intention of the church cannot be contrary to the plain words and the intention of Christ. Satan concludes that Luther did not consecrate, but only offer, as the heathens might do, the naked bread and wine. Okay. Um, I guess we should just finish here. Woodhead then makes this brilliant comment on Satan's last point. Here again we see from whom the first reformer learned such language. Ubi scriptum est. Where is it written? Where hath God commanded or enjoined it? And to plead verbum dei against the church, i.e. their own sense thereof against the churches. For what the words of scripture be, both are agreed. And this with an addition of clara verba scriptura, plain words of scripture on their side, when a thousand men to one think the contrary, when as no words of scripture, how clear soever, are interpretable so as to contradict any other scripture, and the clarum verbum, plain text, must comprehend not one sentence affirming what we would have, but the whole word of God as nowhere gainsaying it. And then who is so fit, who so fit to judge, of the whole as the church. So this is the this is this is proof texting. You find a verse here, a verse there, it's contradicted by that other one, we just kind of forget about those. This is an old tactic. Luther admits that the Catholic bishops will say here, who does not know that the devil is a liar? He gives them this repost. It is true that the devil is a liar, but then his lies are not of the common make, but far more subtle and abler to deceive. He insists there is always solid and undeniable truth on his side, by which Satan speciously colors over his lies, as almost to deceive even the most cautious, as when Judas' heart smote him, uh, that thought of his was true. I have betrayed the just blood. This Judas could not deny, but that was a lie. I must therefore despair of the grace of God. Luther concludes that what Satan said about the Mass was true, but was only used to cover up the lie that Luther should therefore despair. He ends up by challenging the Catholic bishops to defend their church against Satan's arguments if they can. In his, 19, in his 1533 confession, Luther imagined that Satan's design in the 1522 colloquy was to make him despair like Judas for having committed such great faults amongst which Satan, as the Reformed after still do, do still, reckoned his idolatry and adoration of the Eucharist. However, Satan's purpose was altogether different. He thought that Luther was bold and given to novelties and already quarreling with his superiors. So he made him swallow those things for truths, to turn him into a pretended reformer of the church's doctrines and practices. Woodhead also links Luther to Muhammad in the spirit of Martin Luther. First, in his rejection of the sense and exposition of scripture received in former times. Second, in his coming not with miracles 
or a spirit of temperance, meekness, and patience, but with a spirit of fury, defiance, and railing. And third, in his indulging sensuality and the natural appetites of the flesh, while opposing the formerly esteemed counsels of perfection, such was the spirit of the patriarch of the Reformation. Wow, that's pretty intense. So Martin Luther does what the devil wants. Martin Luther thinks the devil has good points. Martin Luther hates the Catholic Church for the same reason the devil hates the church. And Martin Luther is like Muhammad. If you're a Protestant and you're shocked by this, these are, I mean, you can look up this work yourself. I mean, it's available. And then you can look up the source material if you'd like. But uh, yeah. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless.